Okay. Many people have corrected my pronunciation. So I hope I'm getting this right. Malikayang Pagong Taon. Did I say it right? Pagong <laughs> Taon, right? Right. I'm saying it right. Okay. <laughs> okay. So Palapain Kanang Dios. Amen. All right. So today is the first day of the year 2023. Now, I want to ask you a question. Looking back to 2022, has your relationship with God gotten closer? I see, I hear some on this side. Have your relationship with God gotten closer? Amen? Amen. You know, starting this year, the church have, we are, you know, especially those who are watching online as well, we are starting a reading through the Bible. I've sent the, uh, the link to all of you. And those who are watching online, you can find this reading through the Bible plan in the church app. So go through it. If you follow this plan, you would have read through the Bible. We do it slow, so in three years' time, you would have read through the Bible from Genesis to Revelations. And today, we're going to be, this, mo this whole month actually, we're going to be exploring the book of Ecclesiastes. Now, how many of you had a, ever had a conversation with someone where every word, you understand every word, but when it's linked together in a sentence, you have no idea what the other person is talking about? Have you ever had that experience? You know the book of Ecclesiastes is like this sometimes. You know, you know every word, but when it's all put together, it's like you're scratching your head. What is the writer trying to say? What is he talking about? It's full. It's a very difficult book, I have to admit. I read through it, you know, trying to prepare for this. I've, I read through it many times, and I'm still trying to grasp the meaning because it's so full of riddles and ambiguity. In fact... You know, Jewish scholars almost didn't include this book in the Talmud because it was so hard to understand. Now, praise the Lord, they did because today we have a very, very rich book that leads us to explore, you know, the every situation in life. And, you know, and we can explore with the writer. And to understand what is, because the question he kept asking is, is, is the today's, actually it's today's uh, title of the message, can you, we all read it together? Is life worth living? So I want to ask you, is life worth living? <laughs> kind of, oh, such a, such a difficult question, right? In the uh, first day of the year. You know, so to Help us to understand this and to go through this month, this book. We're going to you know, take it slow. Don't worry. Take it slow. And we're going to just explore the background today. Okay? So you understand it better. Actually, we could divide the book into two parts. Chapter 1 to chapter 6 explores, you know, the inconsistencies of life. In, you know, in chapter 1, it says everything is vanity. All is vanity. And we're going to... We're going to take a look at this word because this word is the key word of the book. And in chapter 2, it talks about vanity of vanities. All right? So, and then in chapter 3 to chapter 6, is what is, you know, this vanity of, what is this? So what is this word? What is this talking about? What is this, what is, what are the inconsistencies in life? Because in chapter 3, you have, you know, that famous whole chapter where there's a time of, to die, a time to live, a birth, a time, you know, a time, a time of this and that, opposites, right? So we're going to be exploring that in the coming weeks. And then the second part, you have chapter 7 to chapter 12. Then it talks about, okay, what are the inconsistencies? And then the second part, it tells you, explains it to you. What are, you know, explaining the life's inconsistencies? So you have, so the being, the vanity of being in chapter 7 to 9, and then living life, how to live life well, in chapter 10 to 11, and then you have the source of true living, and that is, you know, and that redeems the whole book in chapter 12. So we're going to start first, okay? So the question that this, the writer keep asking, uh, 
you know, flew out the book is called, Is Life Worth Living? And Ecclesiastes, so that you understand, is actually one of the five uh, wisdom books. Who went through Pastor Ed's Old Testament survey? Remember, study through the, he, he talks about it. There are five wisdom books, right? You have Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and the Song of Psalms. So Ecclesiastes is one of the wisdom books, and it is called wisdom books because it teaches us God's wisdom. And, but we're going to be exploring the background. So we want to understand who's the writer, all right? What is he writing? What is the occasion? Who is he writing to? And what's the message today? So make it very simple. So let's take a look at who is the writer in chapter 1, verse 1. It says that the words of the preacher, the son of David, king in Jerusalem. So who's the writer? We know that it is someone who calls himself, it's a preacher who calls himself the son of David. He's the king in Jerusalem. So it must be someone who is in high rank. And scholars, you know, they've, they've, this, they've usually agree that it is King Solomon who is the writer. Now, how many of you know King Solomon? Only one? How many of you know King Solomon? Come on, don't be shy. Otherwise, I can't go on. <laughs> okay, <laughs> two, <laughs> three. <laughs> so King Solomon, you know, he's the wisest man on earth. He's got wealth. He's got wisdom. He's got, oh, we all know that he's got plenty of women. He was famous. You know, he was so famous that even the queen of, right, remember? She, but she came all the way, she came all the way to listen to him. People from around, you know, all the, the nations, they come to listen to his words of wisdom. Yet the wisest man, the most powerful man, the richest man on earth, at the end of his life, he says in verse 2, Vanity of vanities, says the preacher. Vanity of vanities. All is vanity. Now, I like the Tagalog. Okay, I hope I'm, okay, I hope I'm not going to butcher the Tagalog one. Okay, so it says that, I, okay, let me read this properly. Napakawalang, right? Kapuluhan. Napakawalang, napuluhan. Kapuluhan, lahat ay walang kapuluhan. Sabi nang magang garaw, right? Am I saying it right? Yeah, okay, good. You understood me, right? Okay, good. So the preacher was saying that vanity of vanities, all is vanity. Right? So I like, actually, I like the Tagalog translation of vanity. It says, kapuluhan. Kapuluhan, it means significance. And walang kapu, kapuluhan is that there is no significance. So why is the richest, most intelligent, wisest, most powerful man on earth at his time says that everything is no significance? So, and actually, he's echoing Questions that today a lot of people are asking. Is life worth living? What is the meaning of life? So, we know who's the author. He is, we agree that it is King Solomon. Okay, we're going to talk about why he said that everything is, there's no significance in everything. Then number two, so what is the occasion? So, the, so we find the clue in the word preacher, all right? The Hebrew word for preacher is, okay, I need to say all these right, a lot of terms, so bear with me. It's called, it's in the Hebrew word for preacher is kohalith, okay? So this is a term that has a root in another 
Hebrew word which is kahal, meaning assembly. So this is a person who speaks to, like what I'm doing now, to an assembly, to, the commun to a community of people. So obviously, so the occasion is that he is speaking to a, an assembly, you know, of people who are there. And right now, you were, you know, People sitting here, they're all in different stages of life. Some, you're just a child. Some, you're still a student. Some, you're uh, waiting, you know, for God to provide you with a spouse. Some, you're already, you're married, you have children. Some, you're already grandparents. You know, we're all in different stages of life. And this message actually the preacher is speaking is for every one of us. But, you know, but there is the scholars that believe that it is especially addressed to young people, younger generation. Because in Ecclesiastes chapter 11, verse 9, it says that rejoice, O young man, in your youth. So he's talking to young people in particular, okay? And let your heart cheer you in the days of your youth. Walk in the ways of your heart and the sight of your eyes. But know that for all these things, God will bring you into judgment. And then in Ecclesiastes 12, verse 1, it says, Remember also your creator in the days of your youth. So he's emphasizing when he's explaining about the life's inconsistencies that, you know, remember when you're young. Remember your youth. Of making many books, there is no end. And, and much study is a weariness of the flesh. So he's talking to an assembly of people, especially younger people, to give them his wisdom. Because he's lived through, you know, the different stages of life. He's got, right? He's, he's got all the pleasures. Everything he ever wanted, he's done. Oh, the woman he, you know, he ever loved, all this, all the wives and the concubines, he's been, he's been through all of that. He's been through, you know, speak, giving wisdom, teaching other people how to govern the country. He's given wisdom to other people to, about the relationship with God. So he's been through it all. And now he's speaking to, to his subject, to his court. You know, and especially to the young men and women in his court, sharing the wisdom that he had. And what was what is that he shared? He said, "Vanities of vanities." So, what is the message? Why vanity? Right? Vanities of vanities, says the preacher. Vanity of vanities. All is vanity. You know, vanity. Walang kapuluhan. It's a key word that runs through this book. And it appears, just in this verse 2, it appears five times. So he's trying to emphasize something. And in fact, in the book itself, in the book of Ecclesiastes, can you guess how many times he actually used this word? 38 times. And in the, all, the whole of the Old Testament, this word is actually used 73 times. So there's a significance because when God repeats something, it's important. You, understand? you agree with me? Yeah. So it's important that he, why he's using this word. Now, vanity in Hebrew is kabel. And it talks, it's talking about emptiness. It's referring to mist, vapor, or breath. Okay, so that's why walang, wait, I've got to get that right. Where is it? <laughs> ah, well, okay, so it's, where's my world? Oh, okay, so walang kapuluhan, no significance, it's nothing, right? So why is it, why is everything nothing? But interestingly, it's talking about the shortness, breath, 
vapor, everything that could go instantly disappears very fast, right? And you know, interestingly, this word habel first appeared in the Bible in Genesis. It was actually a noun. It's a name of a person in the story of Abel, Cain and Abel. How many of you know Cain and Abel? Okay, two person. Come on, you guys have to give me this. The first day of the year, you have to give me some response, okay? Otherwise, I'll be really like, my energy level will go down. How many of you know the Genesis story of Cain and Abel? Amen. Okay, good, better. What happened to Abel? What happened to Abel? His life was cut short by his brother Cain. Right? And so, actually, Abel's story, it just, you know, Habel, it's vapor, it's a mist, it's emptiness. It, the Abel, Habel, it actually embodies the meaning, the full meaning of this Hebrew word, meaning it's fleeting. It's gone very quickly. Interesting that God uses this word and King Solomon uses this word to explain the shortness, the briefness, vanity, fertility of life, the, you know, and, you know, and how we, and we are all, and what was the one thing that Abel, besides being killed by his brother, what was the one thing that Abel was famous for? In the story, do you remember? Hmm? In Matthew, let's take a look. In Matthew chapter 23, verse 33. So that on you may come all the righteous blood shed on earth. Whose blood was shed on earth? Was Abel. Remember, Cain killed him and his blood was shed on earth. From the blood of righteous Abel to the blood of Zechariah, the son of Barakiah, whom you murder between the sanctuary and the altar. This is Jesus rebuking the Pharisees, the Jews, for killing the prophets. And one of the, one of the you know, and it goes all the way from the first man, the son of the first man, Abel, to the son of the last prophet. Actually, Zechariah, he was mentioned in the, you know, towards the end of the Old Testament. So that span, he's saying that you guys have been killing, you know, men of God, righteous men. You've been spilling his blood on earth. And Abel was known to be the first man of faith in the Bible. Remember, they, were, they came, him and he and his brother, they came to God to offer the first offering, tithes, in the whole entire Bible. He offered the choices, the best out of his flock. And Cain just came and whatever, right? And God was pleased with Abel's sacrifices and Cain got jealous. That was the first killing in the, in the Bible, and blood was spilled on earth, and Abel's life was cut short. Now, are you wrapping your mind? I don't want to give you the minute, right? So that's vanity, habel. This word, Abel, meaning life cut short. It was a short life, just like vapor, just like mist, just like breath, gone very swift. So now are you, try, are you understanding this now? Okay. And as men and as children of God, as children of faith, believers, we are all child of Abel, children of Abel. Because Abel was the first worshiper. Now how many of you are worshipers of God? Come on, you have to lift your hand. Come on, I need to see those hands to lift. Are you a worshiper of God? Come on. 
Amen. Now, Abel was the first worshiper. It's that in the Sesso, in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 4. By faith, Abel offered to God a more acceptable sacrifice than Cain. Right? That's the story. Through which he was commended as righteous. God commending him by accepting his gifts. And through his faith, though he died, he still speaks. Can we say it all together? He still speaks. And who is he speaking to? He's speaking to us through the preacher in Ecclesiastes. So what is he trying to tell us? That habel, vanity, this is the nature of the word meaning, you know, brief. Meaning short, fertile, no, sub no sub significance, right? That's the, that's the Tagalog word for it, no significance. Cut short. So, life is short. We're here for a season. Now, how do you choose to live? You choose to live a life that is foolish, fertile, meaningless, right? Or very frustrated, looking at only seeking the things of the world? What kind of life are you going to live? You know, there's a term used to be the last century called YOLO. Have you ever heard that one? That word, you only live once. And because you only live once, they will, you know, the young people at that, it was very common to young people. I don't know if your kids, your, cho your own children have gone through. You only live once, so you only live once, so I'll go and party. You only live once, so I'll do something dangerous. You only live once so that I'll do so, I, I would do something that against, you know, the authorities because I only have one life. And they're right. You only have one life here on earth. So how are you going to live it? Because the decision that you're going to make of how you live on earth is going to affect what happened afterwards. Isn't it? So are you going to live a life seeking world's pleasure? King Solomon did. He lived a life seeking world's pleasure. He lived a life seeking woman. He lived a life seeking, you know, wine. Seeking wealth. Seeking the adorations of people. And at the end of, towards the end of his life, he said, vanity of vanities. Everything has no significance. You live, you die, you be, you know, you plant, you plow, right? Summer, winter. Everything has a cycle, but it's just meaningless because that cycle never ends. Is that your life? Do you feel frustrated about the way your life is going? If you are, take heart. The Bible has, that's what the book of Ecclesiastes is telling us. That yeah, it can be meaningless if, you, if all you do is pursue the pleasures the, you know, of the world. If all you do is pursue the ways of the world. So how are you going to live your life? Here in Ecclesiastes, chapter 4, verse 15. You know, Abel died. He died without, I think he died single. He was, he was not married. He was very young. Okay? But in the Bible, there was a continuation in, the Bible, in here, in Ecclesiastes 4, 15, it says that I have seen all those living under the sun move to the side of the second youth. So there was somebody else who replaces him. And that was his brother, Seth. So, 
the line didn't die. And today, as believers, as worshipers, we are all children and the line of Abel. All right? In 1 Corinthians. Oh, sorry, before I go to that. Let's, you know, even though he died, he was murdered by Cain. He lived on through us. We are his descendants. And he lived on through Christ, the second Adam. You know, another person who lived a very short life. Can you guess in the New Testament? Jesus. Jesus lived a short life as well. He only lived 33 years in the world. Yet, you know, he lived a life with no, no children, no descendant, right? No wife. But he lived a life according to the will of God. Even though he was not married, he had no biological children, but he has us. Spiritual children. We are all child of the living God. Amen? You can say amen louder than that. Come on. Amen. So, we are, you know, we are all living, right, worshipers. So life is not short for us. There's another part to it. You know, even... Though the life on earth is short, but we have an eternity to look forward to. Amen? So how we live, that's what, the, that's what the book of Ecclesiastes is trying to teach us. What kind of life do you choose to live here on earth? Do you know that you're redeemed by Christ? Yes, in the Old Testament, you know, we have only one life. We live here on earth, you know. Abel died very young. But guess what? You know, we carry on the spirit of Abel as worshipers of God, as believers. We carry on. So life has meaning. It's not just vanity. It's not walang kapuluhan. There is significance. And what is that significance? It's our faith in Christ, our hope of the what's after, right? Our hope of eternity in heaven with Christ, with our God. Amen? So how are you living your life today? We can just go to, you know, wake up, eat breakfast, go, go to work. After work, come back home, watch a little bit TV, relax, go to sleep, and then do it, get back and do it again. Or we can spend time in the presence of God, getting to know God, at building a relationship with him. That's why we have the read through the Bible plan for you, us, so that we get to soak in the presence in the Word of God. You know, so I hope that 2023 is a year where, you know, we're going to start, if you have not done it before, or if you've been just, oh, reading the book, the Bible, not really, not really, you know, just like reading a story, but I hope that this is the year where you really get to study the Word. Really understand that life has meaning, right? As you read, and I hope that as we're going through, you know, the Bible series, the sermon series this month, you're going to read the book of Ecclesiastes. You know, like I said, it's divided into two parts. First part, chapter 1 to 6, it talks about, it explores the inconsistencies of life. But the second part of the book, it talks, it explains it. Yes, there's, you know, there's inconsistencies. There's, you know, you live, you die, you, you know, you might be working and then you lose your job. Somebody died in the family. 
You're sad. But guess what? Life has meaning when we live in the will of God. That is chapter 12. I hope you will go there and read it. Life has meaning when we are living in the will of God. Oh, wait. I'm going to end with this. In chap in first wait. In 2 Corinthians. This I'm going to end with this. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17 to 21. Now, can we read it together? One, two, three. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Can you turn to the person next to you and say, you are a new creation? Life no longer is meaningless. The old has passed away. Behold, let's read this. The new has come. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Congratulations. Life is no longer meaningless. Life is no longer just, you know, the experiences of life is no longer just a vapor, a mist. No significance. When you're living in the will of God, you are a new creation. Everything is new. Amen. And you know what? He gave us what? Let's read this in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 19. Let's continue. Let's read this together. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself not counting their trespasses against them. So your sins are no longer count against you. You have life, hope of life, and entrusting us the message of reconciliation. So each one of you has a mandate from God. You are to carry the message of reconciliation to the community around you, to your employer, to your friends, to your family. And next, let's continue, verse 20 to 21. Let's read this together as well. Therefore, we are ambassadors of Christ, God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake, he make him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Tell the person next to you, you are the righteousness of God. And as, you know, Christ came not just to free us from sin, but to give us something even better. To give us life with God. To help, to make us, empower us to become the righteousness of God. So that you're no longer living, you're no longer carrying that label, I'm a sinner. Now, the label has turned around. Remember? Oh, uh, no, you weren't here. Oh, sorry. You weren't here. We didn't do that one with you. You know, I want you to think back. Before you know Christ, how will your life has been? Now that God has, Christ has touched you, how, are your, how is your life being transformed? Instead of saying, here, I am a sinner, now it says, I am the righteousness of God. Amen? Now your life has meaning. Because you're living for God right now. You're living in the will of God. How many of you say amen to that? So if you are in Christ... We should be thanking Christ every single day. We should have this heart of thanksgiving. That's why we are worshiping Him. We are not just here to, we're not, you know, we're not just here. To, the worship team is not here just to sing a song. You're not standing there just to sing a song. We are worshiping God. God, you're so wonderful. You're amazing. God, you love me and I love you. I want to follow you. I want to give my life to you. That is how you should be 
every single day, wanting to get close to God. Right? And He gave you His righteousness in exchange. That life of sin into a life of light. A life that is, you know, that is going to carry His righteousness to the world around us. So let us be thankful that our life is not, a van- is not vanity. Our life has significance, has meaning, because now our life has Christ Jesus in it. Amen? Amen.